Well, this is a really gosh darn big locomotive, uh, bigger than most of the ones I've ever gotten to see. And you can see that I'm standing right here at the very front of the locomotive or what normally looks like the front. What's up guys, this is Heiss and today we're here at the California State Railroad Museum, Sacramento, California. The museum's fantastic. We did another video kind of going around and reacting to all the different things as we saw it throughout the day. But this is one locomotive they have on display that I wanted to talk about in a little bit more depth, the cab forward. So why have the cab in front rather than in the back like a conventional steam locomotive? The answer is simple, smoke and tunnels. The Southern Pacific Railroad had the combination of steep grades, long tunnels, and heavy trains to run through the Sierra Nevadas, which ultimately birthed this design in the early 1900s. Putting the cab up front and the stack at the back meant that the smoke and deadly gases weren't being breathed in by the crew, allowing for better safety. That's right. What normally is at the back of the locomotive is actually right up here at the front of the locomotive. The cab forward was a locomotive that was developed to deal with a lot of specific problems related to the long tunnels on the Southern Pacific. They were really the only railroads that really did a whole ton with them, and they're really neat locomotives. Let's take a look at all of the fun details that we can see here on the locomotive. By essentially reversing the locomotive in relation to its tender, a lot of logistical problems arose that needed to be solved. Chief among these would be the delivery of fuel and water to supply the boiler. Locomotives tend to burn one of three fuels, wood, coal, or oil. Wood and coal logistically don't make any sense with the fire door up at the front and the source of the fuel at the back. Putting the tender in front would change how the locomotive tracks, particularly at high speed and visibility and all those things. So the locomotive had to burn oil. Typically, head pressure or a slight tank pressure is all you really need to deliver oil to the burner in the firebox. But now the burner is an extra 60 some odd feet away, requiring more work to be done. For water, the injector still needs to be relatively close to the fireman so he can monitor its operation which means that the water from the tender tank must make it all the way down the length of the locomotive, which merits an extra steam turbine pump to ensure there's enough pressure supplied to the injector for it to work. Then for reasons of proper heat distribution and water cycling, it makes sense for the delivery of the water supply systems to deliver up by the smoke box, once again, all the way at the other end of the locomotive from the injector. Both of these systems incur additional nuance when you remember that the tender is attached to the bit that swivels. Remember that the cab forward is an articulated locomotive pinned in the middle so that the front engine set can swivel relative to the rest of the frame and the rest of the locomotive. And so anything that needs to run to the tender has to have an extra swivel joint because the tender is attached to the bit that moves. All of the extra equipment to make all of these systems work are placed in an odd way, and that's partially due to the fact that the Southern Pacific had a tight width loading gauge. Here's your daily reminder that the Rio Grande narrow gauge engines are actually about six inches wider than anything the SP ran, including this cab forward. That's right, 491 is wider than this locomotive. You take that thought and then factor in the fact that you have to reverse almost everything in the cab for the sake of controls, and that leads to a couple of fun oddities in the design. You that reach is... out the window <laughs> and blow her down. <laughs> Did you not notice that? <laughs> no. That's what I meant. You have to reach out the window to blow it down. Oh my god. <laughs> the the sound effects. Yeah. That's a fun touch. But it's not doing the. <laughs> It is. It is. Yeah. It is doing the Let me turn on pew, the air pump. Pew, pew. Oh God. <laughs> that is the starting valve for it, isn't it? It is. And then of course there's the cab controls to consider. Normally you face towards the boiler with all the controls oriented in that way, but this is just utterly backwards. Yeah. Almost everything had to be reversed. Both the engineer and the fireman are set up facing forwards, looking out the window rather than towards the boiler with a lot of space in front of them. The gauges are set up in a pretty ergonomic way, and actually almost everything, save for the water glasses, is actually set up in a pretty ergonomic way, which makes a lot of sense. 
making the piping to the glasses longer gives more flex and more chance for clogging. So why would you even bother doing that when you could just turn your head? So that's your inject. That's damper? oh no, this is for the. That's your injector. Yeah, yeah live yeah. steam. So this is overflow. Yep. Live steam. Are these injectors or inspirators? Because I don't know. Those look like injectors. And then your uh, blowdowns out the window. Yep, blowdowns back there. You've got firing, firing valve. valve. Presumably one of these is atomizer. Probably this. Probably That's yeah, probably your blower, manifold. Actually. This is. Lord knows, I have no idea what that is. Oh well, maybe. I don't know what that is. It runs down the boiler up past yeah. the U joints for a while. So. Well, that's through the bells up here, isn't it? Mark, you know the one thing that stinks about this? What? Water glasses are still behind you. The water glasses are still behind you. Yeah, so you'd have to look around. And that doesn't look terribly ergonomic to actually see from the fireman's seat. It's an engineer size, finally. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's fun. I want to go see the fireman's side. Go. Come. Come in. There's, Come do. Would you like to dance? There's enough room for <laughs> There is. You can actually dance in this cab. Okay, there we go. Oh, that's weird. Yeah, it's ADT. Okay. Like, it's the big boy. Your your sight glass blowdown is right here. Oh, is that what that is? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. Or shut off, maybe, but... Oh, it's cylinder cocks. Cylinder oh, cocks. Oh, that's yeah. your cylinder cocks? That's, the, that's what it says on it. Right, because, yeah, it's it's got to have circuits being inarticulated. Yeah, a lot of the SP Superpower stuff didn't actually have a, a w true whistle valve. It was a whistle circuit. So, even the GSs... <laughs> You, you didn't have control over the whistle, so Doyle do redid have, it to do it so you could pull it. This one has a whistle it. and a horn, right? Yes. Anything. Can you imagine being on the head end of a train coming down a mountain with nothing in front of you? Just, <laughs> just going, what's the view out the front? You can actually see. So you must be thinking, why didn't other railroads use this design? Plenty of other railroads had grades and tunnels. Well, railroad strategies related to breathing in tunnels is probably its own entire topic to cover at some point. But the main reasons are the number and design of the tunnels, the fuels burned in plain old tradition. Few areas of the railroad are as tunnel and snowshed filled as the Sierras, and many roads with tunnels chose other avenues such as ventilation to help sort out the breathing problem. Many railroads also only wanted to burn coal and didn't really want to burn oil or add the logistics of a new fuel source. As well, a lot of crews really didn't like the idea of the cab being at the front. It seems so natural to us today, but back in the day, everyone was used to having a mile of locomotive ahead of them. If they were going to hit something, it was very far away and they would be safe. When you think about the lack of ability to stop a heavy train, you don't want to end up being the crumple zone yourself. And in the case of the cab forward, that was really kind of the truth. A lot of early diesel locomotives on many railroads ran long hood forward for this same tradition. It was that big of a deal. No matter why the other roads didn't use them, the Southern Pacific did. They really did. Ultimately, the SP would build 256 cab forward type locomotives across a number of different classes. There's a few other examples in the USA that need not be mentioned, and a few others across the world, but few can capture the raw spirit of the 4294, the very last of them all. Anyways, guys, thank you so much for watching. The cab forward is such a cool locomotive, and it's great to see the 4294, the very last one of 256 of the entire class, of all the different classes of cab Fords, still around, preserved to great condition here at the California State Railroad Museum. So make sure you check out the museum, make sure you support your local museums, and as always, thanks so much for watching.